1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Apostle Paul traveled by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to the city of Ephesus, preached the gospel among those idolaters uh, bound in darkness, and the gospel light broke through, souls were saved, the church was established, men and women were discipled. Then Paul, as was his custom, moved on to another place and left Timothy in charge, left Timothy in place to pastor that church. One of the duties that was necessary in these cities once the church was established and a pastor was put in place was to ordain elders, deacons, and then that strange Bible office of bishop about which there is a great disagreement on those rare occasions when someone actually bothers to bring it up. And what we learn from the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, is that God never intended a church to be a one-man ministry. And every church that is a one-man ministry is doomed to go only as far as that one man can take it, and that's not very far. Uh, if the church centers upon the pastor and idolizes, adores, man of God's, the pastor uh, to, a, to a, a, an extreme, uh, that church will become uh, man-centered, centered on that man, not on Christ. That's not a good thing. If you have a man that doesn't desire that, uh, works, works himself uh, from morning to night and strives with all of his ability to build a church but never has any men step up and, and rally to the cause, uh, that man will wear himself out and the church will go nowhere. But if you have, if you have a devoted pastor and devoted men in that congregation, uh, God can build a great church in a city and it's very, very important. The Bible says in, in, in uh, Hebrews 13, and we'll, we'll go there in just, just a little bit, uh, that uh, Christians are admonished to obey them that have the rule over you. Not him, them. So the Lord did not anticipate churches with a single leader. The Lord did not anticipate churches where one man was responsible for the entirety of the ministry. Brother Steve Jones brought a, a fine uh, message uh, just the other evening in my absence on Moses and Christ and the typology between the two. And, and the passage where uh, Moses was worn out with handling the duties and the responsibilities of just trying to help people in their life. From morning to night, from morning to night, day after day, people needed advice, counsel, instruction, and even under the Old Testament law is recognized, uh, Moses' father-in-law uh, speaking wisely said to Moses, you, you can't do this. You've got to appoint some, some people to assist you with this and to help you with this. Moses never ceased to be the leader of that congregation, but he was able to lead that congregation for four decades because all of the burden was not placed upon his shoulders, but that, that yoke was, uh, others entered into that yoke and helped, helped him carry it. The pastor that is afraid to trust other men with a nursing home ministry, a, a street uh, preaching ministry, a prison ministry, a, 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 a senior's ministry, whatever the case might be, uh, he's either going to have to do it all himself or it won't be done. And so it's very, very important that we recognize, first of all, that God wants more men in the church than just the pastor to be fully committed to Jesus Christ. And it's also important that those men understand that we're not, we're not looking for competitors for the pulpit and, and competitors for the leadership position but we're looking for people to help carry the work forward and farther than it could go if it was, as we said, resting upon one man. And so the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, an official recognized position within the church, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. 
Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Uh, later we'll talk about the deacons, lesser qualifications, but uh, serious nonetheless. In verse 14, these things write I unto thee, Paul, the apostle, the, the founder, if you will, of, of this church at Ephesus, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So Paul's not there. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So God's church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The pastor's not the pillar and ground. The bishops are not the pillar and ground. The deacon's not the pillar and ground. The vote of the congregation's not the pillar and ground. The church that Christ established, He is the chief cornerstone, the foundation, the apostles and the prophets. That truth is not to be added to. That truth is not to be diminished. That truth is to be maintained. And so we're not looking for preachers that can come up with some new revelation. We're not looking for churches that can find some new way of doing things. We're looking for men that will continue, will perpetuate what was started by Christ and the Gospels and the Apostles in the book of Acts and keep that thing going in this town, then the next town, then the next town, then the next town. And so you, you've lived to see a day when, well, each generation has seen it in some form or another, but uh, Roman Catholicism was a departure from the pillar and ground. P Protestantism was a departure from the pillar and the ground. Uh, the charismatic movement of a hundred years ago was a departure from the pillar and the ground. The, the, this, this modern uh, rock and roll uh, show church is a departure from the pillar and ground. And each of these have, have had this idea, well, let's do something contemporary. Let's do something that, that fits our culture. Let, that's, that's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to take Christianity and overthrow the existing culture. Take Christianity and establish a church in spite of the existing culture. That happened in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Philippi, and wherever the gospel is truly proclaimed. Uh, they, they didn't go to Philippi or, or Corinth or Ephesus and say, well, what would the people here like in a church? They went there and said, this is what Christ ordained. And establish that. And so, so if you're a Christian, your, your first responsibility is to, is to find a place of assembly and to be there as directed by the leadership of that assembly and listen to and follow the teaching, not just from the pastor, but from the leaders around that pastor so that you can be part of genuine, true, historic, biblical Christianity. Not, not, they used to have this uh, saying back when people went to church, uh, attend the church of your choice. Find the church of your choice. No, you're to attend the church of God's choice. You're to find the church that God approves of and, and make yourself a part of that. Now, so the leadership here, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things, and, and this is what uh, sets me at odds with most of my Baptist brethren, and that's okay. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible, and 1 Corinthians 12, the Bible mentions gifts that God gave to the church. And one of those gifts is pastor and teacher. That is a gift. It is not an earned office. It is a gift. And the reason we distinguish between the earned office of bishop and deacon as opposed to the gift of pastor is if, if you're going to make bishop pastor and pastor bishop, you could never have a pastor because everyone has to be a novice at pastoring at some point in time. Our guys finish Bible school and churches call and say we're, we're interested in, in having one of your guys come here and pastor a church. Is he a good preacher? And I always have to give the same answer. How good can he be when he's only preached four or five times in his life? You, you can't be an accomplished preacher without years of preaching. But you can't have years of preaching unless you have been of a heart that will preach without a pulpit. 
All over America you have guys called to preach and they haven't preached for years except on special occasions when the pastor's out of town because when they say I'm called to preach what they mean is I'm paid to be I'm called to be paid to preach in a pulpit. If you're called to preach, you'll be on a street corner, you'll be in a, you'll be in a laundromat, you'll be at a bus stop, you'll be in a football game, Amen. you'll be anywhere people are preaching, if that's what God's called you to do. Now, if you've been called to be a paid pastor, say so. That's a whole, that's an entirely different animal. Uh, but but the, the, not, the idea of, of a novice, you have to start somewhere. Now, we, we're not going <laughs> to, let me be real careful here. There is nothing wrong with a God-called, God-blessed, God-gifted young man, 26 years old, pastoring a church. But God help that man if he doesn't have some deacons and some bishops around him to keep him from making the messes 26-year-olds make in their novice career. I started a church at age 21 sent by a Bible college to a town with their support to start a church. What a dumb idea. <laughs> we got it started. It's still going. I was in so far over my head. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I bet you learned your lesson. No, at 24, I did it again. <laughs> started another church in another town. You say, what came of it? Well, about 100 people got saved in three years. Praise the Lord. 60 of them out knocking on doors. We had visitation, praise the Lord, and I found a wife there. So, hallelujah. And then they kicked me out. Because the men I had around me weren't supporting men, they were envious men. Big difference. And then I waited a while until I was mature, and at age 28, we started this church. The reason I'm still here is because this time I got a wife. <laughs> Kept me around for Lillian's sake. I don't <laughs> Listen, it's one thing to preach. It's one thing to teach the Bible. But God wants it done in a church. You're not an internet pastor. That's a perversion of terminology. You don't assemble together in your separate homes with your favorite dead preacher on, on the internet. That's, that's, not, that's not scriptural. But if you're going to build a thriving, successful work, the congregation has to trust the pastor, and the pastor has to trust some men that are around him to help him with not just uh, counsel and, and advice and, and dealing with people in situations uh, with, with, uh, with all kinds of uh, things here. And so the Lord spells out these qualifications. And before we dive into them, here's what I want to ask you. Verse number one, this true saying, if a man, if a man, and we've got, uh, praise the Lord, unusual situation in our church, 50% of our adults are men. You don't see that in most churches. It's usually about 80 20. Women 80%, men 20%. But the Bible says if a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. And here's what I'd ask you if you're a saved man in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, this is what I'd ask you. What do you desire in life? There's nothing wrong with desiring a nice house. But the Bible never commends anyone for desiring a nice house. There's nothing wrong with desiring a good career. The Bible never, never praises anyone for desiring a good career. Do you desire to be a man so, whose life is so devoted to Jesus Christ and the people of God that God could entrust you in, with one of these offices in a church God says, now that is a good thing for a man to desire. Praise the Lord. You know, if you devote, if you really, if you really put your heart into it, you could earn a degree in just about any field in four years. You could master that field in six years. You could earn a doctorate in seven years. You just pick a field of study. Engineering, make a good living. Architecture, make a good living. Uh, women's studies in third world countries, 
get on welfare and uh, but 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 you could get a doctorate if you if you gave yourself to it in seven years. You know in the Bible, the Holy Spirit sent preachers into a city where nobody had ever heard about Jesus Christ. Souls got saved, the church was established, and a year and a half or two years later, Paul came back and ordained elders. Somebody was a lot more serious about Christianity then than they are now. I don't know many people who have mastered Christianity in two, three, four years, or five or six years. And so the Bible's available, Holy Spirit's available, preaching and teaching's available, ministry opportunities are available, discipleship opportunities are available. The only thing lacking is the, is the desire Come on. The desire to, to have a, a, an office in God's church. I don't mean a paid salaried staff position. When we say office, we're not talking about a cubicle. We're talking about somebody the church recognizes as, I can take my marriage situation to this man. I can take my financial situation to this man. I can take my emotional problems to this man. And this man will, will tell me exactly what the pastor would tell me. He will help me exactly as the pastor would help me so that a multitude of men are able to minister to a multitude of people rather than one man struggling to remember everyone's name. I mean, seriously, think about it. It's a much better setup biblically than, bless God, we have a pastor, we run 3,000 on Sunday morning. And you're going to call that guy and you got a problem? He's going to spend an hour with you every week till you get it worked out? I bet he's not. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you and doesn't care for you. He might not have even met you. So this is, this is God's working model here for the, the, the church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, so uh, here, here's the next thing where my brethren disagree with me, uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're friends. We love each other. But the Bible says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And they say, well, he's got to be a one wife kind of guy, or he's got to just have one at a time. Or he's got to at least stay with this one. Okay, let me ask you something. Is you must be born again, is that optional or must you be born again? Should be born again many times till you get it right? Or must you be born again? I mean, must is, it's, it's funny how must is crystal clear whenever we read about it until we read about it here. So what are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm reporting to you what God said. A bishop must be blameless. If there has ever been church trouble and you caused it, you can't be a bishop. If there's ever been discord, if there's ever been an uprising, if there's ever been a split, if there's ever been a heresy and you were part of that, you can't be trusted to be in leadership in a church. You have so many men that come to churches and they want to be in charge of something, and in order to get in charge of something, they start undermining the leadership that exists or undermining the doctrine of that church. That is not the way to get this office. The way to get this office is not to subvert the pastoral leadership and not to subvert the doctrine of the church. It's to strengthen it in every possible way and to help that pastor fight off the inroads of modernism or liberalism or worldliness or false doctrine or modern versions. And so what we need is someone who's proved himself to be above the fray proved himself to never be one of those sniping and griping and murmuring and complaining, but always one in a, in a supportive role and supportive position. And then as we've talked about in the last few lessons, the Bible says, the husband of one wife. Now why would you start there? Why would you start there? Not, not uh, a great teacher, a great speaker, or, or a great, uh, having great Bible knowledge. Well, look again at verse number 4. 
uh, one that ruleth well his own house. Verse number five, if man know, know how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? Look, you, you can knock on doors, you can win souls, you can give out gospel tracts, you can uh, d conduct a nursing home service, you can hold a gospel sign on a street corner, you can do a thousand things for Jesus Christ that don't involve leadership. Amen. But here's the true test of leadership. Can you take a wife and be to her what Christ is to the church? Well, you know, I got, I got problems in my marriage. Okay, nobody's, nobody's condemning you for that. Nobody's hating you for that. Nobody's saying you're not saved. We just can't put you in a place where other married people are looking to you for help because you won't know how to help them. I mean, that's... I don't want a guy walking to work who's a mechanic. I, want a guy to, I don't want a guy working on my car whose car doesn't run. I like when I go to a place and the chef is way overweight. I don't want the meth guy cooking my breakfast. And, and, and the objection is, the argument is, well, preacher, you know, my wife is stubborn or my wife is rebellious. You know what God said? you got to figure out how to make that thing work. Because if you're going to be a leader in a church, you're going to be, be dealing with men, or maybe 50 of those. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you, we've got, our, our homes are in trouble. And people get saved. And they, they, didn't, they didn't have a father growing up in the home to direct things. They had a mother's out, out working and, and carrying on and to, 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 to be what a mother's supposed to be. And they get married. The guy doesn't know how to be a, a husband. And the girl doesn't know how to be a wife. And everything's all chaotic. And they come to church and they get saved. Praise the Lord. They know how to get to heaven. But they don't know how to get through next week. Well, what if your church is growing? Praise the Lord. 10 new people, 30 new people, 40 new people. Guess what you got? You probably got half a dozen marriages that need a lot of help. Well, wouldn't it be great to have people who knew how to help them? Men who were able to rule, provide for, direct their own house. So that when people come to God's house, they have people there who can help them with their house. Praise the Lord. Now, when I say this, people are going uh, to uh, strip their gears because they're more loyal to their favorite preacher or preachers than they are to the Bible. But if you can't stay married, and God said that's the first thing on the list, I don't want your advice. Can you help me with the most important matter in my life, my marriage, when you couldn't manage one. Now, that doesn't mean people aren't saved. doesn't mean they're not right with God. It doesn't mean they can't be in church. doesn't mean God can't use them. But God said, I can't put them in leadership because they're not blameless. Yeah. Mm hmm. Can't you just preach salvation every Sunday morning? I could, but we're out of room. <laughs> so we've got to teach the rest of the Bible. Husband of one wife, vigilant, vigilant. You know, people love their stuff. It's okay, you got stuff. I got stuff, you got stuff. And so people put up a fence, and they put up a gate, and they put up security cameras, and they get, get a phone where they can watch their stuff while they're, while they're gone so nobody takes their stuff. You know what that is? That's being vigilant. I'm watching my stuff because I don't want anybody to hurt my stuff. You know what God needs? He needs people that feel that way about the souls of those with whom they go to church. Where is he? Did the devil get him? Where is she? Did the devil get her? Where are they? Did the devil get that family? Oh, they're gone? I didn't notice they were gone. Oh, they haven't been here? I didn't notice they hadn't been here. Then you're not fit for leadership. Look, it's okay to come to church just for you. 
It is. It's okay to come to church just for your family. But if you want to be a leader in the church, and it's a good thing, and you ought to desire that good thing, you can't be coming to church for you. Amen. You've Amen. got to be coming to church for everyone. Amen. And you've got to help watch that influential, carnal, worldly teenager. You've got to help watch for that, that girl that's thrown out the dress standards and is now following the, 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 the latest trends of showing off the flesh. And you, you've got to watch for that guy slipping the literature into people in the hallway and in the parking lot. You can't just come and go and not notice what's going on. Right. You've got to be vigilant. Uh, you can have, you have uh, great uh, weapons and training and soldiers and plans, but if you don't have people on the ramparts watching for an enemy invasion, you're going to get overrun. And so Lord says here, vigilant, sober, sober. We like people get excited about Jesus. We like people get down the dumps sometimes. You ought to get down the dumps every now and then just seeing the mess that your world is in and the dis disaster your country's become. But you know what the Lord's calling for? It? Sober. It, it doesn't just have to do with alcohol. Your culture's reduced this thing where it's just about alcohol. The reason they, they, you say, well, you know, I was an alcoholic or I was a drunkard. Now I'm, now I'm sober. It means now I'm back in my right mind. You know what you need for spiritual leaders in church? People in their right mind. Because I say, and I say this, I'm, I'm so old now. I don't know what you're allowed to say and not say anymore. I don't watch your stupid TV stuff. So, so I don't know. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people in our country that are nuts. You can't say, you can't use that word anymore. Okay, crazy. You can't use that word anymore. Okay, cuckoo. Psych, I don't know. I'm just telling you, there are, there are so many people that are not in their right mind. When they come to church, they can't get help from other medicated people. They can't get help from other people that are flipped out and, and, and living in fear and living in terror and, and up one day and down the next. You gotta have, God's got to give you a sound mind, and he can. But how can I convince you that, that the comforter can help you with your troubles and that, that the scripture can, can give you peace and joy if I don't have any. You, you understand? If I was, I might as well just go ahead and light the fuse. If I was going to go to a counselor instead of a preacher, first thing I'd ask him is, do you believe I came from an ape? Yeah. Good. How are you going to help me if you think the foundation of my life is monkeys, not God? And the second thing I'd ask is, what kind of meds are you on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay somebody to tell me how to think, and they can't cope with life? Now listen, if, if you have emotional problems, we're here to help you. Believe it or not, we, we're here to help you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're struggling with things, we're here to help you. We're not here to tell you, stay like you are, it's cool. We're here to help you. But if we're going to lead you into a better life and a better mindset and a better emotional condition, we can't lead you there if we've never been there ourselves. All right, so the bishop, the bishop must be sober of good behavior. I believe everybody, everybody saved should be in church every service. I believe that. I also believe everybody that's saved has a reason to not go to church. We've all seen church leaders do corrupt things. We've seen corrupt leaders do immoral things. I'm not talking about you disagree with them on something. I'm talking about, you, you know, you know I'm talking, what I'm talking about. Money stuff, women stuff, uh, cheating stuff, all, all that. All that. Uh, you can't put somebody in, in an office in a church who does not have a reputation for good behavior. Why? Again, look at Ephesus. They're idolaters. They're, they're, sexual immorality is rampant in that city. Uh, perversion is rampant in that city. These people get saved 
but they're still 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their societal norms are ingrained in them. Talk to Brother Holt when he goes to Africa, or, uh, when the backs get to New Guinea. It's not like just go there and, and, and drive them down the Romans road and get them to say a prayer, and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're American uh, Christians. Well, that, that wouldn't work. Uh, <laughs> six, 60 year ago American Christians, they got a lot of stuff to get worked out in their life. If you're no good, how can you take people who've lived badly all their lives and lead them into a good life? And so we need spiritual leaders surrounding the pastor, uh, reflecting, uh, supporting the pastor who are well-behaved Christians. Praise the Lord. Given to hospitality. Some of you work in a hospital. Some of you have been to a hospital. You know what a hospital is? It's a place where damaged people go to get repaired. You know what a church needs? It needs somebody that can help damaged people get repaired. Amen. Our society is full of damaged people. More than you would know. More than you would know. I, I, would, I would say, and I, I, I don't hesitate to say this, I think, I think I'm right on this, and if I'm not, God knows my heart, I'm, I'm not trying to be wrong, I think I'm right on this. I look back on my days in high school and in college, and once, once in a while, you would encounter someone who had been badly harmed as a child or as a youth. This internet, came along with its sewer of pornography being pumped into almost every home in America, and now it is it has almost become the norm for people who have been molested, abused, harmed. The damage done is incalculable to a life. Incalculable. Now, you know what? You know what church got to be? It can't just be preaching, it can't just be soul winning, it can't just be standing on a street corner shouting the gospel. It's got to be a hospital. And if, if you don't have a heart and, and the patience to help broken people try to get themselves put back together, you're welcome to be in church and sing your heart out and get in the choir and, and wave your hand and, and cheer the preacher on. But if you're going to hold an office in the church... You can't just say what's wrong with her. You got to find out. And you can't just find out. You got to try and help it, fix it. Man, you don't want to go to the ER and the doctor said, Man, you got a broken arm. Get out of here. <laughs> you want him to diagnose and say, You got a broken arm. Now let me bring in somebody who can set the arm. So you come to church and the preacher preaches and he said, You know, that thing's broken in your life. And you say, well, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see the preacher about getting that broken thing fixed in my life. And the preacher says, I'm sorry, I don't have a, an hour free on my calendar for four weeks. Are you kidding? You want to be in a good church? You want to be in a thriving church? You want to be in a growing church? You can't have the pastor all to yourself. Well, then he's got to have some help. And you've got to be able to trust that help as much as you trust the pastor. Amen. And that's where these offices come in. And that's why they're such a good thing, such an important thing. You can have, you can put up a sign and get a band and have a thousand people come every Sunday morning and rock out and praise Jesus. But you can't help them in the areas of their life where they need help if all you got is a, is a, a, a good-looking, friendly, dynamic preacher, you got to have some hospital workers given the hospitality, apt to teach. Guys, I love you. I do love you. I, I, I'll, give you I'll give you everything I've got to give you. But if you want to be a preacher and you can't preach, be something else. If you want to be a teacher and you can't communicate, do something else. There are, there are men all over this country. They are godly men. They are wonderful men. They love Jesus. They love people. 
And my wife and I go to, church, go to meetings and, 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 and camp meetings and Bible conference things, and we go home and say, what was he trying to say? What, what was the message? And it's not that the guy doesn't love God and love the Bible. He doesn't have an aptitude, an ability to communicate truth to others. That's okay. Everybody doesn't have that. Some people good at math, some people good at science, some people good at English, some people good at PE, <laughs> some people good at cutting classes. I mean, everybody's got different aptitudes, but if you're going to have a growing, thriving church, you've got to have a lineup of men that can step in that pulpit and step in front of a congregation and teach the Bible just like the pastor does. And praise the Lord for it. Well, I'm not coming, the preacher's out of town. Well, you could say that if, if the guy filling in didn't have anything to say. But you can't say that in a good church. Because you, you'll have a man uh, around uh, apt to teach. Now, next thing is not given to wine. And God had to put that in there because if you're going to deal with church people, you're going to be tempted to down a few. Uh, <laughs> Lord said, no, that's not an option. Look, why, why, do people, why do people drink wine? It makes them feel good. You don't have the Holy Spirit? You're not saved? Why do people drink wine? Well, it helps calm their nerves, state of their nerves. You're not saved? You don't have the Holy Spirit? Well, it helps people get over their, their troubles and their sorrows and their trials. You're not saved? You don't have the Holy Spirit? What the Bible says here is, if you're going to put somebody in a leadership position in a church, they've got to be getting what they need from God. Yeah not from substitutes. How, how, how do you stand here and say, what you need is Jesus, and then i got to go home and drink myself to sleep because I have Jesus, but it didn't do me any good. So when someone's given to wine, it doesn't mean we hate them or we look down upon them or you can't come to church if you, if you ever have a drink. But we're, we're going we're gonna to tell you, just like we would the person having, having emotional troubles or mental troubles or spiritual troubles or financial troubles, we're not going to say, come as you are and stay as you are. We're going to say, you can come as you are, but we're going to show you how to get better, how to do better, how to live better. And when, and when people say, well, that's just that preacher, you're going to have a, a room full of men say, no, it's not just that preacher. He's right. And, and that's, what, that's what you need. No striker. You can't punch the deacon in the business meeting. No. <laughs> no, listen, listen. When, when a group of workers goes on strike, they go on strike for this reason. We are not going to continue to do this work for the compensation we're receiving. And until we receive better compensation, we are ceasing work. You know something? You're going to be a pastor or a deacon or a bishop. You're going to have to say, as Paul said, though the more I love you, the less I be loved, yet I will love you. You can't quit if you don't feel adequately compensated, Amen. appreciated, respected. Are you kidding this generation of Americans, they don't respect anybody. They don't appreciate anybody. And the least appreciated and respected person in a town anymore is a pastor. My, my father, you know this, he was a, a banker, international banker, secret Jew. Uh, <laughs> my dad was a banker, and when he went to, to banking school at, at Rutgers, in one of his classes, they, they, they did a thing on the history of banking in America. There was a time in the United States of America you could borrow money and for collateral put up your church membership. <laughs> you wouldn't own somebody a dime today. <laughs> well, what, do you, what, do you got for, what do you got for collateral? I'm a member of the First Baptist Church. Are you kidding? <laughs> You're going to have to do better than that, like your house. <laughs> 
And so in this day and age, when pastors, churches, Christians, the Bible, God are disrespected, do you really think that you're going to serve people in a church and receive honor and glory and acclaim like some internet celebrity influencer? Are you kidding? The people get praised in our society are reprobates. People that are holy and godly and righteous are looked down upon, ridiculed. So Lord's looking for people who do this for Jesus and for others, not for what they get in return. They're not going to quit when it gets tough. They're not going to quit when they get insulted. They're not going to quit when they get disrespected or overlooked. They're, they're going to keep going because it's the right thing to do. That's who we're looking for. All right, next. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Dirty money. You know nothing the Bible speaks against having money or having a medium amount of money or having a lot of money. But however... however Whatever the size of your bank account, God does speak against you loving that and caring more about that than you do the Lord. And I would encourage every young man here, if, if you're making $10 an hour, uh, you ought to try to improve yourself and get where you can make $12 an hour. If you're making $12, you ought to try to improve yourself, get where you can make $14 an hour. I mean, uh, life's easier with money than without it. I'm just telling you, pretty much everything except for spiritual stuff costs money. It's not a merit badge to be poor. But if you're only going to do something for money, your church is going nowhere. If you've got to pay the piano player and pay the organist and pay the song leader and pay the nursery workers and pay the janitor and pay the... Hey, we like to have a nursing home service. Uh, who, who wants 20 bucks this afternoon? How about somebody just do it because those old people need some joy and some cheer and hear about Jesus? Amen. All right, 40 bucks a week to preach in the jail. How about those guys who are on their way to hell and they need Jesus? Amen. So a church, if all the work is going to be done by paid staff, how, how far can that church go? Only as far as the money takes it. If a church is going is to be, things are made conducted and operated and done by devoted servants of Christ, there's no limit to what it could do. So here's the blessing. Uh, the blessing about having the majority of the work done by volunteers is when people come in, you don't need their money. We don't have to have you give for us to minister to you because it's costing us very little to minister to you. You understand what we're saying? See there, he just said it. He just said it. <laughs> I can't help you if that's your heart. Uh, we give to the Lord. We ought to give our service to the Lord. Give our time to the Lord. And if, if somebody says, well, I desire the office of a bishop, what does it pay? What if it pays? Nothing. I mean, money's dirty. You people are germaphobes, man. I, I feel bad for you. I'm not, I don't condemn you. I don't criticize you. But I don't know how you pump gas. Those gas pumps are freaky, man. People wash their hands about to eat, and then they hand you a menu. <laughs> Everybody been in that place since it opened has handled that menu. Yeah. Oh, I never thought of that. I'm going to put hand sanitizer on after I touch the menu. Well, don't put salt or pepper on your food. <laughs> so you know they never wash those things. Oh, I never thought about that. Let me just, I can keep going. You want me to keep going? I, I can freak you out, but at least they wash the dish in silverware. Have you seen who's doing that? <laughs> anyway, we're, we're oh, filthy look. So, <laughs> you want something dirty, man. You want something dirty. Put a microscope on one of these. Here's a, oh, I got a 20. Probably cocaine on this. <laughs> yeah, the, the money was talking down at the bank one night in the vault. 
$100 bill said to the $50 bill, said, where you been? Ski resort, beach, vacation, how about you? Restaurant, the mall, they looked over in the corner, there's a dollar bill, where you been? Church, 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 nowhere but church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, uh, not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, we, don't, we don't need uh, money-loving men in church leadership, but patient. You know why? People don't get saved as, as often as you want them to get saved. Saved people don't sell out and get excited about Jesus as often as you want them to. People don't grow as fast as you like them to grow. Problems don't get solved as quickly as, as they could be solved if people just surrender the, to, to the Word of God and the will of God. Do you understand, if you're going to be a, a leader in the church, it's going to be because you are devoted to Jesus Christ for the purpose of trying to help along people who aren't devoted to Jesus Christ. Well, if they're not devoted to Jesus Christ, you can't force them or kick them or drive them or prod them or drag them. You've got to patiently hope to bring them along. My father, we, we never had conversation. We didn't have conversations. He was, he was the adult, the provider, and I was the, the, the kid who was supposed to do what he was told. And he'd sit in his chair every evening, read the newspaper. I don't remember newspapers, and he, he'd read the newspaper. And if he ever, like once a year, if he wanted to speak ex cathedra from the chair, he'd fold down the corner of the newspaper and look over it and say something you better remember because the penalties were severe if you didn't, and then he'd put the paper back up and go back to reading his newspaper. Anyway, so I got saved. We started the church, second church, and I was over to the house visiting one time, and, and he said, well, how's it going? And I said, ah, you know, just people aren't doing this, and they aren't doing that, and they ought to be doing this, and they won't do that. And he's behind his newspaper, you know. And he folded that paper down and looked at me. He said, son, if God thought every Christian was going to be dedicated, why did he make pastors? And folded the paper back up and went back to his reading. Now, who wouldn't want to be a bishop if you were a leader of a 100% devoted following? But the Lord's asking you to be a leader of people that aren't really even sure they want to go the way you're going. It's going to take some patience. Patient. Patient. Takes a long time. Not a brawler. Some people, man, they're just in a fight with somebody all the time. They just seem to thrive on it. Not a brawler. Not covetous. Not covetous. From my heart to you, I hope you'll take this the right way. If you have, somebody here owns the largest most expensive home in the congregation. I'm happy for you. I don't care. I don't want it. Somebody here drives the most expensive, nicest vehicle in all the congregation. I'm happy for you. It doesn't bother me. I don't care. I don't want it. You don't want people in positions of church leadership who think there's some material advantage to it that somehow I'm going to get something out of people or get more material stuff for myself if I'm a, if I'm a church leader. I mean, come on, that's, that's the corruption and the Catholicism, Protestantism, a lot of these big Bible schools and mission boards and everything. They're just sucking the more money out of churches and church people. It's disgusting. Amen. You don't need people like that in leadership. Look, I don't care how big your house is. Somebody's got a bigger one. I don't care what you wear or where you go. Somebody's got more of it than you do and has had it longer than you've had it. So what? So what? Be happy in life. Be content with your life. There was a man I used to witness to. He bragged about being the richest man in the county. And there was another guy over in the, in the East Volusia, and he bragged about being the richest man in the county. And the guy over on the East Side, he went out and bought a $180,000 Bentley automobile. 180000 bucks. Well, the guy I knew over here that I was witnessing to, he went to the dealer and he said, I want the exact same car and I want you to charge me one dollar more than you charged him. And he did and he bought it. And I went to the junkyard and I got hood ornaments off a Chevy and I, I, I taped them onto that guy's Bentley. 
Wherever it said Bentley, I taped, I taped a Chevrolet ornament all over it. And, and it was on there for like two or three weeks. And one night my phone rang, Knox! What'd you do in my car? I said, why do you think it was me? He said, because everybody else is impressed with it. <laughs> you know what I wanted? I wanted that guy to get saved. I didn't want his money. I wanted him to get saved. He never got saved, and I never got his money. Stetson got it. <laughs> really sad, really sad. All right, so verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. If you can't control your kids, how are you going to help us control a hundred kids? If you can't control your kids, how are you going to help us control bus kids? Amen. Come on. If your house is out of order, this house will be out of order. And we got kids of all ages here. I mean, they go all the way up to the 90s. Babes in Christ, young believers, new converts, people don't have a clue about life. You've got to prove yourself in your own home. Uh, if a man don't know how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? And then, uh, quickly, not a novice, thus being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. Now, the devil wanted Christ's place. He had a place a high-ranking place in the service of Christ. But he wanted Christ's place. You know what the Bible says? If you want an office in the church because you think it's one step from kicking that preacher out and taking his spot, can't have it. Can't have it. But if you're content to not be Christ, not have the chief place, but serve as God has enabled you, then that's a good thing to desire. A really, really good thing to desire. What got the devil? He wasn't content. He wasn't content to be a servant of the Lord. He wanted to be the Lord. Too many of these preachers, you get the impression they don't want to be the servant of the Lord. They want to be the Lord. Man, I don't, I don't want to run your life. God knows I don't want to run your life. I'm here to help you with your life. You got a problem? Come on, we'll step in. We'll show you what the Bible says. Try to help you. Other than that, I'm not looking in your window. I'm not spying on you. You don't have to check with me before you buy a car or a trailer or any of that kind of stuff. Now, if you're going to get married, you might want to talk to somebody that's been married. We might be able to point out a couple of things you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Some people are right with God in the church house and not right with God on the job. That, that's not who we want for leadership. Why? Because we're leading working men. We're trying to teach them how to be Christians on their job. If you're not a Christian on your job, you can't help with that. Lest he fall in reproach and the snare of the devil. So the condemnation of the devil is he wanted the chief place. He didn't want to serve the Lord. He wanted to be the Lord. The snare of the devil, snare of the devil is that, that I can, uh, <laughs> yea, if God said, you don't have to do it God's way. Do it your own way. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. We don't need men in leadership positions in the church who, who have their own uh, doctrines and their own way of serving God and their own way of viewing the Bible. We need people going to be true, straight, strict to the scriptures. Amen. So I would say, I'm going to say this in, in closing. Closing, finally. I'm going to say this in closing. And we'll, we'll get back to this. You are, if you're, if you're new to Bible Baptist Church in Deland, you are blessed to be in a thriving church with countless outreach ministries and activity going on seven days a week all year long. And that's not because of a pastor. That's because of a pastor who is blessed to have many, many trusted men around him who can be turned loose, if you will, to serve God under the leadership, under the direction of the church, but, but go many different ways and doing many different things for Jesus Christ. And what a joy that is. Amen. And God wants you to desire to be one such individual. 
Now, if all you want to do is come to church once in a while, glad you're here. If all you want to do is come to a service now and then, then do, do other things that you, you love more than, than church uh, other times, you know, every time you're here, we're glad you're here. But God said, whatever you're doing that's not this is a desire that's not so good. If you desire this, you desire a good thing. Amen. A good thing. And wouldn't you like to end, end your days and know that you devoted yourself to a good cause, not a, not a meaningless cause? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Somebody, somebody did a lot for you to get you where you are in your Christian life. And Lord, I'd like you to step up and do that for others. Amen. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for giving us your truth and your word. Help us, Lord, to dedicate ourselves uh, a little bit more fully each and every uh, week that goes by, a little more fully to serving Christ and serving others. In his name we pray, amen.